Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 66, Seneca is examining some important issues within Stoic ethics that are often not all that well understood, and he's, he's explaining them to his interlocutor, Lucilius, and thereby to, to us. Now, he begins the letter by talking about running into a childhood, you could say, friend and also classmate, and he tells us a few things in here that are important foreshadowing for what's going on within the letter. He, he tells us that uh, he's begun to see his friend Claranus in a new way. He seems handsome to me and as upright in stature as he is in spirit. And, and what is he you know, bringing that up for? Well, Claranus is as old as Seneca is, and his body isn't in great shape. So this is a prime example of something that is, from the Stoic perspective, indifferent. The body being made beautiful and good by the mind or the soul, which is virtuous, which is one of the things we're going to be talking about in this, this letter. The other thing is he brings up this conversation that he and Claranus were having as a pretext for introducing these ideas to us. He tells us our, our topic for discussion was this. How can all goods be equal to one another if they are of threefold status, if they're three kinds of goods? And he tells us that there, there's, there's, these are both stoic positions, right? There's three main kinds of goods, and you might say, well, okay, I'll go with you on that. Let's see what the stoics have to say, and we'll come back to those in just a moment. But then the first part, you might say, well, well wait a second here. How can all goods be equal? Who said that they were equal? Well, the Stoics did, because that is one of their main commitments about the nature of the genuine good. They're not saying that everything that everybody considers to be good are equal. As a matter of fact, they think that most people have fundamentally mistaken ideas about what's actually good and what's bad and what's within this realm of what we call the indifferent. And this indeed is something that many people had a hard time accepting. It, it's what we call one of the Stoic paradoxes, that all good things are equal, and you know, likewise, all bad things are equal as well. And you might say, well, how can that possibly be? You know, nobody else says things like that, do they? Not even the other virtue ethicists, like the Platonists or Aristotelians or Epicureans. They seem to think that there's multiple kinds of goods. And the Stoics say, well, insofar as they're good, no, but then, and then you might say, well, why are you talking about there being three kinds of goods? So Seneca lays this out for us and he tells us, what are these three kinds of goods? Primary, secondary, and tertiary. And in the Latin, it's just that, you know, uh, prima, secunda, uh, tertia, meaning, you know, first, second, third. Oftentimes these would be framed in terms of a hierarchy of values. And indeed, we can talk about the tertiary goods as being, in some sense, below the other goods in a way that we'll see in just a, a few minutes. Let's talk about the primary goods. What are the examples that he provides? Well, he gives us several right here. Joy, peace, the safety of one's homeland. If we look a little bit further down, uh, he, he, when he's talking about the principal good and the mind that gazes at what is real, knows what to pursue and to avoid, assigns value to things in accordance with nature, uh, the spirit that injects itself into the cosmos as a whole, all those sorts of things. Those are all primary goods, right? And then we have the secondary goods. What are those? Well, here's some examples. Endurance under torture. 
Self-control during serious illness. We might think about battlefield courage as another prime example of this. Nobody, unless they're you know totally unreasonable or they're following wrong-headed desires, is, is going to seek out a conflict. But once you're actually in conflict, in order to protect other things that you do consider to be good, like say your freedom or uh, the, you know protecting your country or um, protecting justice or something like that, you will put yourself in, in risk of bodily harm. Bodily harm is not a good thing by itself, right? Nor is risking things a good thing by itself. But he talks about these secondary goods as being manifested in unfortunate material. That is, they, they take place when the things that we're dealing with are not optimal and may in fact be quite bad in many ways. It's not good to get sick, right? It's not the calamity that a lot of people think it is, but it's definitely not something good and it imposes hindrances and harms upon you of certain sorts, certainly to your body. And therefore it requires some sort of response that's a good response, bearing illness in the way that one ought to. What about these tertiary goods? Let, let's think about his examples. He says, uh, a modest walk, a calm and dignified facial expression, gestures befitting an intelligent person. Um, you know, these we might not be able to relate to entirely. We might want other kinds of walks or other kinds of facial expressions. A lot of these are culturally determined, you could say. But there are appropriate actions and inappropriate actions, the way that the Stoics conceived of, of, of that sort of thing. In Greek, they called those uh, kathemata, and in, in Latin, they called them afficium. Sometimes these are translated as duties or things as being contrary to duty. But there is this general idea that in, in all sorts of things, like if you're going to wear a tie, for example, well, you should tie it in a, in a certain way. I mean, I could loosen it and be more casual if I'm trying to you know, show that I'm a, a cool guy who doesn't take the, the rules very seriously. Or I can also tighten it up to show another sort of thing, a seriousness about uh, the thing that we're studying. And there's a, lots of ways, right? And so each of these is understood as being a certain kind of good. Seneca tells us that primary goods are chosen unconditionally. We say, yeah, those are good things. We want those. We choose those. We pursue those. Secondary goods are chosen when necessary. You don't choose to endure torture for the sake of enduring torture. If you do, from a stoic perspective, you're misguided and imprudent and vicious. Likewise, you know, with the tertiary goods, they're chosen in some sort of sense. They're chosen... Perhaps we might say when they are convenient or befitting. Convenienter, by the way, in Latin means, you know, it, it fits the occasion. It fits the circumstances. So he goes on and he provides us with a little bit of context here by talking about and thinking about the supreme good. He says, let's go back to the principle or supreme good. Consider what kind of thing it is. I just brought this up a few minutes ago. The spirit or mind, the animus that gazes at what is real, that knows what to pursue and to avoid, that assigns value to things in accordance with nature and not by opinion. The spirit that injects itself into the cosmos as a whole and casts its contemplation over every action of the universe. The spirit that attends equally to thought and action, that great and forceful spirit, not vanquished by adversary, adversity, nor again by the blandishments of prosperity, that does not yield itself to, up to either, but rises above all contingency, all accident, that most beautiful spirit, well marshaled in grace and likewise in strength, sound and sober, tranquil and undismayed, that spirit that no power can subdue, no chance event can elevate or depress. That's quite a panegyric there, isn't it? Uh, running through the entire paragraph. What is that spirit? What is that mind? Virtue. That's what virtue is. Virtue allows us to have all those sorts of things. Virtue embodies itself in all those sorts of things. So virtue is what the primary good is, what the, the good that is making other things good is for the Stoics. And he goes on and he says, okay, now if we understand it this way, then we have to acknowledge certain things about virtue. He says that 
virtue takes on multiple aspects, right? And so, you know, we might think about the, the cardinal virtues that the Stoics, in fact, distinguish. Seneca doesn't go into that too much here, but it's lurking in the background. Wisdom, justice, temperance, and courage. Each of those is a kind of virtue, right? And each of those is virtue. Each of those, by the way, has other virtues under it as well. So, so, you know, courage includes the kind of courage that stands up to fear, but it also includes endurance of hardship, right? And justice doesn't just include following the rules or fulfilling one's pledges. It also includes uh, beneficence or benevolence, being good to other people, right? So virtue takes on multiple aspects and it does so in relation to what gets translated typically as conditions or circumstances. In, in the um, Latin, it's, uh, you know, the, the term race, which just means thing or affair. And it's usually in the plural in this, this discussion. So within, you know, different uh, frameworks, within different situations, in relation to different things, we, we exercise virtue in different ways, but it still remains the same virtue, according to Seneca and according to the Stoics. He says, uh, virtue uh, is, is not permitted to retreat. It becomes neither less nor more. It's transformed first into one quality, then into another, shaped according to the condition of the things it's about to do. He's got this wonderful phrase here that I, I very much like. He says, Whatever it touches, it attracts and tinctures with its own likeness. It adorns actions, friendships, sometimes entire households, which it has entered and put into order. Whatever it handles, it makes lovable, remarkable, admirable. So virtue takes the, let's call it raw material of life, and transforms it into virtuous stuff, right? Right? So the virtue isn't any greater or lesser in doing so. It, the material may be more or less suitable for that, but the virtue remains the same. And he goes on and he says, it's, its power, its magnitude cannot increase anymore, if only because that which is greatest has no augmentation. When a thing is right, you will find nothing more right, any more than a thing can be truer than what is true or more temperate than, than what is temperate. Every virtue is the limit, and a limit is, has a fixed measurement. And so you might say, well, that goes against our ordinary experience. One person can be more temperate than another. And, and Seneca, you know, could respond by, he doesn't hear, by saying, well, the raw material is different, right? That guy over there who has terrible habits and is, is struggling to, you know, not have his 10th serving at the buffet, you know, at the wedding that he's, he's attending, stuffing himself so much that he has to undo his belt buckle and his pants, you know, all these sorts of images. If he actually does exercise temperance, the temperance that he's exercising is just as much as the temperate, temperance of the super temperate person, according to Seneca. And that may be a little bit counterintuitive. He tells us a little bit later that um, each virtue is equal to each other. He says, human virtues come under a single rule. Right reason itself is single and uniform. So the virtues are equal to each other, as are, here's another key thing, the deeds or the actions of virtue and all persons who possess the virtues. And again, this is rather counterintuitive and probably you know, requires more of a justification than he's, he's actually providing here. And the Stoics do, in fact, treat this quite a bit. Now, here's another point that he's going to make over and over and over again in this. If anything could add to or diminish virtue, then virtue itself would be, would be lacking. There would be a problem there, a kind of deficit. He says, if matters external to virtue either diminish or augment it, then what is honorable ceases to be the sole good. If you concede that, then the honorable ceases to exist altogether. And he's got a really interesting point here that makes him almost sound a little proto-Kantian. 
uh, well, or Abelardian or any, anyone else who is really stressing the importance of motive. He says, everything that is honorable is voluntary. Mingle it with any reluctance, any complaint, any second thoughts, any fear, and it loses its best feature. It is no longer self-determined. So he says, if a person refuses something, complains of it, thinks it is bad, then he is disturbed and welters in grievous conflict. On one side, rectitude appears and summons him. On the other, harm is suspected and causes him to withdraw. So he's going to provide a lot of examples that we don't need to go into in great detail about why it is that virtue has to be the same in all virtuous acts, all virtues, all virtuous people. Um, what we're really interested in here is more the upshot for the three kinds of goods that he's, he's going to discuss here. So um, he's going to frame this in relation to another key idea of the Stoics that, again, he's sort of assuming some, some uh, background knowledge of on the audience's part. He's not going to argue for or explain in great uh, depth and detail here, but he's going to discuss elsewhere. And that is being in accordance with nature or being against nature or contrary to nature. So the Latin for that is uh, secundum naturum and the... Uh, uh, you know, opposite of that is contra naturum. And those are the, the words that he's using here. So this is a really important Stoic idea. And we do have to explain this a little bit. To be in accordance with nature doesn't just mean to simply accept how things work out mechanically within the universe. It also means to be in accordance with what you might call our best nature, our, our human nature as fully developed, which is not really the case in any of us. We can, we can be more fully developed or less fully developed, but there is sort of this ideal, and it's often talked about in terms of the sage or the wise person, who would be fully realized, right? And we can, we can use that as kind of a model, and Seneca does that. So the three kinds of goods, he says, the primary, secondary, and tertiary, are on a par, Right. Uh, what that means is that um, they're going to be um, inequality, you could say, in equos. So they're they're in some way on the same level. How so? Well, he talks about this a little bit later on, and there is some stuff I want to come back to here. He says that um, the Primary goods, so for example, having virtue, being free, um, having joy, having peace, all those sorts of things are in accordance with nature. So when we're experiencing them, um, we or when we're pursuing them, we're actually, you could say, connected with, with how things ought to be. We're in a greater communication with the universe as such, right? And um, that's all fine, right? That's pretty straightforward. He also tells us, though, that secondary goods, things like showing, well, really, almost everything concerned with fortitude or courage, the, the, one of the cardinal virtues, and a lot of things concerned with justice, and quite frankly, a lot of things concerned with temperance, these are, in some respect, contrary to nature. They're contrary to nature because their material is contrary to nature. They're not things that we want. So being sick, for example, you know, having things going on in your body that actually do, to some degree, affect your mind, depending on how you allow them to, um, that is contrary to nature. It's not, it's not being in a good state health is, is uh, you know, in accordance with nature. Disease is contrary to nature. Um, not in the moral sense, but in the sense of not being, you know, not being good for it. It's very difficult to avoid this word good and bad, right? Um, but our, our actions, our choices, 
the things that we do in relation to these obstacles, these challenges, these, these things that we face, that is in accordance with nature. So it's both in, and con- in accordance with nature and contrary to nature. What about the tertiary goods? Well, here Seneca doesn't really carry on the conversation that well. And I think he's assuming that his readership already knows about this sort of stuff. For the Stoics, all these sorts of things that we consider to be largely indifferent and don't produce great obstacles for us, but could go one way or could go the other, you know, like my tie. Do I have it loose or do I have it tight? Um, How do I walk? Do I make an attempt to enunciate properly? Or do I kind of slur my words like this because I'm being lazy, right? All those are basically indifferent, but they could be good or bad in in some minor sense, depending on how virtue is using them. So let's take the last example. If I'm slurring my words and my goal is actually to communicate to you something about Stoic philosophy, which presumably if I was a Stoic, I'd care about, right? I want the audience to actually understand that. Then speaking in a sloppy way would actually be something bad. Not bad in the sense like, you know, I'm destroying people's minds or something like that, but you know, it's, it's not good. And, and speaking in a clear way would be something good. Right? Um, recording this in a fairly quiet environment rather than right next to the train tracks, that's probably in the class of the tertiary goods. And now are they contrary to nature or in accordance with nature? They're in accordance with nature, but they're, you could say, in a lesser way than the, the primary goods. So insofar as they're goods at all, They're all in accordance with nature, but they're in accordance with nature in different ways. And insofar as they're goods, they're all connected with virtue. You might say, well, what about the tertiary goods? Well, you can use them in the right way, use them in accordance with justice, use them in accordance with temperance, use them particularly in accordance with wisdom. That's part of the backdrop here in Seneca's um, point of view and the points that he's, he's trying to make. Now, he finishes this up with a very interesting uh, discussion uh, about a guy who was a great hero to the Romans. And here he's going to make a a case. He actually says that um, if any goods could be greater than others, I would have given preference to those goods more than the others. I'd have said that the harsh ones are greater than the soft, luxurious kind. Beating down one's difficulties is greater than governing one's delights. Why? Well, because in a certain sense, you can tell that you're really virtuous when you have to struggle, right? Not just when you're enjoying the fruits of virtue and everything's going along uh, just fine. So he talks about Musius, right? Now, Musius went into the camp of one of the, the, the enemies of Rome. This is in the early days. To show him how, to show the king how tough Romans were, he stuck his hand into a brazier filled with, with red hot coals and stood there with his hand burning away until Porcenius ordered them to take the brazier away. He was like, point made, right? That took incredible fortitude. Right? So Seneca is looking to that sort of example. I, I don't know that we should go too far along that path with him. The main point is that <clears throat> what, he, what he's making here, saying that if all the virtues are on an equal nature, these three types of good, therefore, are on this, this par or on equality, and we can connect them all together. So that is Seneca's presentation of this very important topic in Stoic ethics that involves genuine paradox. All goods are actually the same unless we consider them from certain perspectives.